Okay, Angela, why don't we just start out by you, you're describing sort of the nature of your research. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's pretty interesting, so give it a go. I'm a biological oceanographer. I'm here at the University of Hawaii, Manila. Um, I've been here just a few years, but um, the reason for coming here was to work with this program called the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series. This was begun by Dave Carl and others um, 30 plus years ago. So it's this really just incredible community resource where we have this long time series record of ocean biology, ocean chemistry, ocean physics at a site about um, just to the north of Oahu, uh, a place called Station Aloha. So what we're really doing in this time series is, is just documenting how these ecosystems work, how uh, standard biological and chemical and physical properties change over various time scales from days to months to years to decades. Um, and that's been my sort of heart's uh, favorite research <laughs> for quite a while here, even before I came to, to UH Manoa. Um, but beyond that, we've worked in, you know, coastal upwelling regimes off the Pacific Northwest, um, in Antarctica and in the Arctic as well. So have, from the time series, have there been major changes in that? You're looking at a water column, right? Um, yeah, we're looking at a, we call it a watch circle, you know, a few kilometers of a circle radius where we have uh, deep water moorings, um, where we do ship-based sampling of the full water column from the very surface to the seafloor, just right above the seafloor. Um, so we're really looking at how various properties are, are changing in time. Um, some of the sort of highlights from this program are we've documented very clear and concise changes in seawater chemistry that reflect changes in um, CO2 from human emissions more CO2 in the atmosphere, there's more CO2 in seawater as you're seeing air-sea gas exchange. Um, we've got a really strong awareness now of the various climate drivers of ocean biogeochemistry and how it changes the production of these ecosystems. And I would say this is probably one of the few time series that is sufficiently long enough that we've started to see emergence of ocean change within the context of the natural variability of these ecosystems. Are there things to be concerned about? Well, I mean, the CO2 certainly is something to be concerned about. So, you know, as I said, this exchange from um, anthropogenic, so as we emit CO2 into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases, there's exchange of that gas with the surface seawater, and that's changing the just fundamental chemistry of seawater. It's, it's making, making it less basic. It's this process called ocean acidification that you probably would have heard of. And in changing the acidity of seawater, the pH of seawater, what you've really done is if you've used changed the environment that these organisms are living in. So for certain organisms that need to build shells, little coccolithophores or coral reefs, it makes it more challenging for them to really build the, the environment that they are so reliant upon. So that's, that's one process. You know, obviously changes in, in temperature on a global scale are concerning. We see that um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you probably heard of the blob that was there a few years back. Um, some of the temperatures that we've been observing globally around the Arctic are quite dramatic as well. Um, you know, seeing 90 plus days off of Anchorage and you know, two to three uh, degree Celsius anomalies off the waters in that coastal environment, those, those do have pretty profound impacts for ocean ecosystems. Talk to me a little bit about the impact that the onset of COVID-19 had on you. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I'm a seagoing oceanographer. I, I run a seagoing program. So this immediately posed challenges because Going to sea on a research vessel, although we call them cruises, they're certainly not uh, luxurious. <laughs> no shuffleboard? <laughs> no, no shuffleboard on the Lido deck, nothing like that. Um, you know, you're working in close quarters over long hours, and that's not something that is conducive with the changes that were necessary to make to protect the science, the marine center, the ship's crew from potential exposure to COVID. So in the very beginning, those of us, myself included, who uh, went on the cruise after the pandemic um, outbreak, we went into strict quarantine. You know, each and every one of us were isolated in our homes without, um, you know, interaction with other people. 
Uh, we were doing daily temperature monitoring. We got tested two weeks before the research expedition, um, tested again three days prior, and then moved on to the vessel, but with a severely reduced crew. So we were only able to sail on this giant vessel, the Kilimoana, it's a beautiful vessel, um, with only 11 science crew versus the up to 26 that we would normally take. So obviously we were um, not able to do as much in the amount of time that we had. Um, and sometimes it took, you know, working a little bit longer, a little bit harder than we had in the past. And that being said, you know, we were one of the very few that were lucky enough to be actually able to go to sea. There were certainly many other groups that um, off of the islands that either because their labs were closed or um, travel was restricted um, or a variety of other reasons were unable to participate in planned cruises. So for the entire research fleet along the, around the United States and, and even globally, there was a significant reduction in ship days. So the number of vessels going to sea and carrying science. We were viewed as one of the essential activities, um, the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series being an essential National Science Foundation uh, funded activity. So uh, with those quarantine efforts in place and the enhanced testing, we were able to get out there and, and make the measurements that we needed. And in 2020, we had 50 days at sea which is our normal, normal allocation of, of ship days. Um, but those, those were hard won. It's a, it's a strange reality, right? Wearing masks at sea and socially distancing. So you, you can't all sit in the galley at the same time and you can't serve yourself and you can't just, you know, commune with one another like you normally would. And, you know, you're doing these operations over the side that can be physically strenuous and um, doing that with a mask was, was quite, it's strange. And, you know, we kept that up for all of 2020 and are still keeping up those protocols in place for 2021. Um, so it's the strangeness has continued. Well, yeah, I was going to say, um, since then, have you, how much has this affected your research or your productivity? You know, I guess what it's done is, is really make us think about, you know, what our core measurements are and how we can best allocate our time and resources to protect that core set of measurements and to make sure that the time series integrity is extended. So some of the cruises in 2021, we extended them in time. So we still did the same amount of work, it just took us a little bit more time because we had fewer people. And you know, that's, that's been the, the real challenge, but again, we are, we are some of the very lucky ones with the numbers being what they are, in Honolulu with our research site being within a one day steam of the port, which is another restriction that uh, UNALS, which operates the fleet has had. Um, it's more likely to be able to go to sea if you're close to a port, we are. So we've sort of passed all these tests and, and been able to, with the reduced personnel, you know, make these really critical measurements and do so in a way that protects the health of the scientists as well as the health of the crew. So, I mean, it's, it almost sounds like, even though it's been a pain, um, you've pretty much been able to sail through. Yeah, that's a good analogy uh, for certain. <laughs> um, you know, the, the timing of it's been challenging. It's certainly challenging for the Marine Center because they've got crew that they're swapping out every three months. And so they've got to build in time for the, the crew to quarantine. Um, that changes ship schedules as well. A lot of the work that was canceled in 2021, people are hoping to get out to sea in 2020, or canceled in 2020, people are hoping to get out to sea 2021, 2022. So there's a real, you know, crunch for people trying to get the work that they have funded um, done in a way. So, yeah, do you know specifically about other places where this has affected their work a little more than yourself? Yeah, I mean, we had, I was part of one uh, proposal that was uh, supposed to go to the Arctic. And because of, you know, variety of scheduling issues and ship issues and travel issues, and obviously the fact that some of those more remote communities in the Arctic, um, in Alaska, you know, have not been impacted by COVID and would like to keep it that way. Um, so there's been, for a lot of the Arctic researchers, some very strict um, rules that have reduced the amount of science that, that is done in that region. 
you know, every, every ship is dealing with this a little bit differently. We here have 14 day quarantines prior to the Lord loading the vessel. Um, there are some groups that are working on 10 day quarantines, some on seven day quarantines. You know, obviously that comes with a cost too, if you're traveling, um, because you now somehow out of your grant need to find some funding for, you know, hotel or, or lodging that's in a safe manner. Um, so that those costs and, and, you know, restrictions to travel and restrictions to access to vessels have impacted scientists around the country. The main things I wanted to explore in this documentary was kind of the combined effects of climate change and COVID. And just in passing, you mentioned one that I hadn't thought of because you were saying that, that uh, many of the, I'm assuming, indigenous communities up in Alaska, if they've not been affected by COVID, and yet they have. I mean, if they're shut down, if climate change is already causing, you know, permafrost to melt, flooding, et cetera, and now they're being shut down by COVID, even if they haven't been affected, yeah, it's kind of a twofer there. Are you seeing that? Not directly here. I mean, certainly we know in, in Hawaii that, you know, native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are more impacted by COVID, um, you know, as are any families that live in you know, multi-generational housing as well. So we're not necessarily seeing that impact our science, but just as a human and a resident of, of the state, you know, we are, are worried for um, and concerned, you know, about the preferential impact of COVID, you know, on some of these uh, populations. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, for, for quite a while now, there's been a lot of climate deniers, climate change deniers, and we've had and we have had sort of COVID-19 deniers. Does, does this sort of, how do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, I guess they're political uh, controversies, right? I mean, I, I feel that, you know, oceanography, science in, in general, it's at its heart apolitical. Um, you know, of course, people have differing opinions about whether or not humans are driving climate change. But our job is to collect the data and analyze the trends. And in doing so, we see just clear, obvious fingerprints of humanity on our ocean ecosystems. And, you know, I think most people love the ocean. And I hope that they would accept and support science that is intended to understand how the oceans work and how they might be changing. And in this moment that we're having in history, um, science should be lauded. Um, not my research, but with we've seen these multiple unprecedented vaccine developments on timescales that we've never seen before. And these developments were the work of, you know, dedicated teams of, of scientists, trained virologists. And then there's the simple fixes, right? Wearing a mask, socially distance you know, all the way up to these complicated technological innovations that we're seeing in the vaccines. So I, I think that it, it really shows how invaluable science is to our society. And I would like to think that, you know, time series are, are playing our part as well. We're, we're able to collect this data and, and point to the ways in which our planet is, is changing um, and sound the alarm um, in case you know, we can enact some change to preserve these environments. But, but how do you sound the alarm when science itself has sort of been politicized? You know, we keep showing it over and over. I'm personally, like, not super comfortable in front of cameras or, you know, doing interviews or outreach, but I will push myself as much as I can to let people know, like, you can look at these data sets. Here in Hawaii, we've got the Keeling curve, you know, the CO2 data that's collected. Um, on Mauna Kea, we've got ocean acidification measurements that we're collecting as part of HOT. You know, these are open access data. They're really straightforward. They're data that we share in every single class from undergraduates to graduates. Data that I talk about to my family and, and friends. And it's just, it's demonstrative. There's no argument about it. CO2 measurably is increasing in the oceans and the atmosphere, and we have ideas of what the consequences for that are going to be. We know that global temperatures are increasing. There's no dispute about it. So 
I think sounding the alarm and, and just being very um, consistent and resolute about the data that we're collecting, sharing that as broadly and often as we can, um, being honest about the uncertainties with this data and creating this conversation, encouraging this conversation. Um, that's, that's, a, that's about as political as I think we can get. My nephew is a um, climate historian at, uh, at, at Reed College. He's a, he's a history major and he wrote a book called Behind the Curve. And one of the sort of takeaways from that book was that scientists didn't do a good enough job of telling their story. You know, they buried their nose in the science, they did great science, but they didn't get out there and explain why this is important. Yeah, and I can understand that. We're not trained as to communicate in that particular way. We, we are trained and we learn this language and this vernacular that's very specific to our individual fields. So often we don't have the, the language that is going to effectively communicate the data that we're you know, so close to our hearts. Um, but I do think that's changing. I do think that there's a, a real palpable understanding in the geosciences in particular that we've got to do a better job of, of sharing our data on a broad platform because there are so many of these things that we're seeing that just aren't, um, they're not controversial. They're not, uh, they're not political. These are changes that we are observing on our planet and we need to do something about it. But you've got to start by acknowledging that, you know, we're not making up data you know, make money in science, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, um, this, this is not a political act to d observe the world around you, right? This is, this is an act of care and love for this one planet that we share. Yeah, the environment, though, does affect science. I mean, the political environment, and I'm just wondering, do you, do you have any more optimism uh, now that there's a new administration? I wouldn't have lost my optimism in the in the past administration, you know, because the people who are making these decisions, you know, when I when I write a grant, I'm writing it to the National Science Foundation, um, to private foundations like the Simons Foundation, to NOAA, to others. The people who work in those environments, they are passionate scientists, right? They've spent their lives doing science, communicating science and care very much about allocating those funds in, in a way that's gonna best advance science. So, you know, the budget at NSF, I know that there were, um, you know, efforts to cut that budget, but that budget was ultimately protected by Congress. I hope that it will be expanded and protected again under this administration. Um, but no, I, I haven't left, left lost hope um, due to the presidents because I think when you filter down through the ranks, you know, we are, NSF is full of scientists, as is NOAA, and a lot of these, you know, private foundations as well are, are really lifting up scientists and giving them a voice um, to protect not just the applied science, but the basic science, the, the science that's just saying, I want to understand how something works, is ultimately that will matter. Um, so I, I do feel hopeful. I think that we are, as a community, doing a much better job articulating um, why science needs to be you know, continue to support it at multiple levels. Yeah, yeah. Now, are there any upsides to all of this? <laughs> I was thinking of, you know, bounce back. I've heard of Kanama Bay, you know, and yeah, what about yeah. lower carbon, emission, carbon emissions from driving less? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we have seen some are you silently cheering saying, yeah, let's just get the station <laughs> down for a while. <laughs> I'm sure there's quite a few marine organisms that are looking around and be like, I'm happy to be alone again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to have fewer humans. I mean, we, we have seen some of these ecosystems thrive. Um, Hanama Bay that you mentioned, you know, it used to see in 2019, I think something like 3,000 sunscreen snorkelers every single day. Um, now in 2021, they've restricted this to 720 people per day, which still sounds like a lot but they're gonna be closed every Monday and Tuesday. And I think the, the improvement of the ecosystem state in that place has really provided a renewed focus on conservation of these natural places. And, that, and that's a bright outcome, um, that certainly is. In terms of um, our carbon footprint, you know, that's, that's a little harder. Um, we know that Lockdowns have led to abrupt declines in emissions. Uh, the latest data I've seen from the Global Carbon uh, Project 
was that carbon dioxide emissions declined by about 7% in 2020. Um, and most of that was due to reduction in driving and transportation. And, you know, as I mentioned before, it's, it's just a simple fact that human activities and our global energy emissions, that they impact the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that leads to warming. And this decline, 7%, it's huge. It's something like 2.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide. But even that large reduction, it won't make a dent in the atmospheric CO2 concentration. It'll barely be perceptible in this large integrated atmosphere. And you go back to Paris Accord numbers, that was suggesting that we needed to cut one to two billion tons of CO2 every single year if we wanna meet the climate change limits for the Paris Agreement. And that limit is to limit the global warming to about two degrees above pre-industrial. So we've got to find ways to keep up these reductions in our emissions um, without lockdowns, right? When we go back to our normal lives. But I think if there's a, a silver lining in this, it's that 2020 really does show, to me at least, that these coordinated changes in social behavior can truly produce some deep emissions cuts. And we can do this. We can reduce emissions and we can do it without lockdowns. It's just going to require cooperation and intention. Yeah, working against that a little bit is that um, we've seen it here in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, where BART ridership is is down dramatically. And there's some concern that some of these um, you know, high-speed transportation uh, um, mass transit systems aren't going to survive um, if, if they don't have the ridership. Um, and I know Honolulu has been trying to build a mass transit for <laughs> since I went to school there. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I've only been here for a few years, but it seems like a quagmire. Um, yeah. I am hopeful for it. I am a high, you know, strong believer in uh, you know, public transportation. I, there's a lot we can do here to improve bike lanes, to improve, um, you know, reduce the number of cars, et cetera. So I, I think that on an island is a good place to do that. Um, I'm hopeful that we're going to continue um, both statewide and nationally to significantly, you know, add money to fix these problems and support public transportation. Are you seeing any other issues that you'd like to raise about climate change and the coronavirus? Any thoughts that you've had about this? Well, I mean, the intersection of these themes, climate change and, and pandemics in general, I, I think it should remind us that we're not separated by, by borders, by, by languages, by color, that we're all sharing the same planet. Um, to me, it's really obvious that we're altering our planet in ways that are gonna burden the next generations and reduce their quality of life. And as I said, I, I think the silver lining in this is that this shows that together, when we act as you know, a global collective, we can reduce our impact. We can embrace resilience and we cannot ignore the changes that we're inflicting upon the natural world. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it should be that there are consequences for ignoring the problems, right? Assuming it'll just go away. You'll wake up tomorrow and it'll be gone, right? That doesn't pan out very well for a response to viruses. And it certainly won't pan out very well as a response to climate change. Thank you very much. That's 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 interesting it, to me just as as a newbie coming into it i guess what i'm struck with too is you know as 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 you know hmm, as westerners we tend to think of yes or no right or wrong this problem or that problem but when you look at climate change and the coronavirus you see all these connections mm -hmm. um you know just think of the meat industry and how that is affecting both the spread of disease and also you know, the destruction of the climate. And I hadn't thought, and I, I don't know whether, how scientists look at this. Do, are they always looking for these interrelationships? And has that taught us anything? Yeah, I mean, I think some certainly are. You know, science sometimes can be reductive. You know, I, my PhD, for example, was on trichodesmium. It's a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacterium that lives in the subtropical oceans, right? I know a lot about trichodesmium. <laughs> So you get to that point where you're trained, you know, in this sort of really reductive looking at individual problems where you can start to make, you know, some progress. And then it's hard to, to take 10 steps back and, and see how it all is connected together. 
oceanography is a system science. You can't just focus on biology without thinking of the chemistry and how the physics are changing those environments. So if if there's any field in geosciences that's looking at connections, it's, it's oceanography. And I know that there's a ton, it sounds like your nephew is one of researchers that you know are looking at how humans and society are interacting with our environment um, and what we can do to change perceptions, to enact change, to, to work across societies as a whole. And that sort of cooperation is, is really gonna be key to getting out of this pandemic to getting out of, you know, to, to really thinking about how our emissions activities are changing our climate. Well, Angelica, I really want to thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you get out on your ship again. <laughs> I'm going out again in February, and they actually loaded today and are heading out right now. And uh, Oh, I'm envious. <laughs> you are welcome at, once the travel ban is lifted to come out and join a cruise. We take volunteers all the time. Uh, I'll be there.